Hello brothers and sisters in Christ. Uh, we're going to do 1 Timothy chapter 3 verse 16. So if you want to turn there, because we're going to turn there at the beginning of every part of this of these series. And we're in part 2 of the series, Justified in the Spirit. So I want to read 1 Timothy chapter 3 verse 16. And then I want to talk with you about the Bible, about the Spirit, the Holy Spirit. And then we're going to get into the scriptures some more when it comes to the New Testament. So 1 Timothy chapter 3 verse 16. And without controversy, great is the mystery of godliness. I've taught, stop there for a second. I've always taught this. I'm going to say this at the beginning of every, every section we do in this. Uh, there's times where God wants us to know who he is. And he's going to reveal more and more of himself through his word to us in our life and our walk with the Lord. But the biggest thing you've got to be careful with is the difference between what the Bible says things are and fallen into the trap of having to know how it works. Great is the mystery of godliness. How it works is going to be mystery. But God's going to reveal who He is. He's going to reveal absolute truth to us. Okay. One of the ones we've already talked about in part one was God, back to 1 Timothy 3.16, God was manifest in the flesh. We talked about that. We don't know how it works. I mean, you have God the Father, who's always on the throne in heaven, and God the Father is always in Jesus Christ, except at the cross. And he calls down and says, this is my son of whom I am well pleased. How does that work? How can the soul be in two places at once? I don't know, but the Bible says we are seated in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. My soul is in my body, and my soul is seated in heavenly places right now with Christ Jesus. How can a soul be in two places one? I don't understand how. That's the mystery. But the Bible says it. it the, the fact is, my soul is in my body and my soul is in heaven. God the Father is in heaven, on the throne, running everything, and he's also in Jesus Christ. We talked about this. Okay? The part we're going to be talking about now is justified in the Spirit. Okay? Uh, the next part we'll get to these other parts. Seen of angels, that'll be part three. Preached unto the Gentiles, that'll be part four. Believed on the world, that's part five, and then received up in the glory. Brother in Christ had a great idea that, can you do a study on this, just this verse. There's so much to this verse, brothers and sisters of Christ, that we can go off of. All right? So we're going to do justified in the Spirit. So I want to talk with you a little bit. When's the first time the Spirit's really mentioned, the Spirit of God? Well, if you know your Bible, in Genesis it talks about the Spirit hovering over the water. Okay? Uh, but my question is, more than anything, is when's the first time, remember like I said, you cannot see a spirit. God himself manifests in the flesh. Jesus Christ said, a spirit hath not flesh and bones as you see me have. Okay? Oh, you can say ghost because the Bible talks about a ghost and it talks about a spirit. They're one and the same. You have the Holy Ghost, you have the Holy Spirit. They yielded up the ghost, they gave up the spirit. God gives every man, woman, and child, child, the moment it's conceived, and we'll talk about that in here, the moment it's conceived, it has a spirit. Because it can't be alive if it doesn't have a spirit. It's got a body, and it's got a soul. So when's the first, but I've always talked about, I'm sorry, I've always talked about how God will put His glory, will surround His glory around the Holy Spirit, so there will be some kind of physical manifestation that you know that the Holy Spirit's there. Okay. So let me ask you, brother and sister of Christ, what was the first ma manifestation for mankind to see the Holy Spirit? Remember, you can't see the Spirit itself, but the glory of the Lord surrounding the Holy Spirit. Um, some will say this, some will say that, but guess what I believe? I believe it was the flaming sword that was guard in the garden. <laughs> you had the uh, cherub, and you have the flaming sword. It's basically fire in the shape of a sword. Remember, what are the three manifestations of the glory of the Lord? Fire, cloud or smoke, or light. Those are the three manifestations. Okay, there's a physical manifestation. Uh, the next one that I believe that's in there for a physical manifestation is uh, the, the burning bush. The bush was on fire, but it didn't burn. It was the Holy Ghost, the Holy Spirit, the Spirit of God. And yet the Bible says that the angel of the Lord was in the bush. Remember, the angel of the Lord is the body. It's physical. Yet it was the Holy Spirit. And remember, we learn in the New Testament where it says, The Holy Spirit, what he hears, that shall he speak. God the Father speaks through the body. 
He speaks through the Holy Spirit. Jesus Christ, the Holy Spirit, the Spirit. Okay. There's, I've always said, and we're going to get into a physical manifestation in the New Testament when Jesus was when Jesus came in the likeness of sinful flesh. Okay. I just want to talk about those. Okay. If anybody has any other stories like in the Bible that I missed, where you could say, when the fire comes down at night and G and God is in the tent. And the smoke in day, you know, with the, uh, when they were traveling in the wilderness, the Holy Spirit comes down. You can't see the Holy Spirit, but you can see the glory of the Lord. It manifests itself in a pillar of fire at night. It manifests itself as clouds during the day. Smoke or clouds. Okay, it's all through the Bible. We see a physical manifestation. But the important part for this study is justified in the Spirit. It's talking about men... What we're going to talk about is men that are justified in the Spirit. So the first one we're going to talk about, there's lots of them, but the biggest one is Moses. You have Abraham, you know, he's, he's faithful and he's true, but the first time you really see justification, hardcore, in a man of God, is Moses. You say, what are you talking about? Uh, the miracles that he did. God did those miracles through Moses. Okay, so when someone has the Holy Spirit upon them, there's going to be some physical manifestation that the Holy Spirit of God is in him, justifying him. And we're going to learn that there's three ways when we get into this that Jesus was justified in the Spirit. God manifests in the flesh. Okay, one is, is there's an outward showing. There's miracles. Moses did tons of miracles. All right. Two, prophecy. Moses prophesied. He told him, this will happen to you if you don't. I mean, when he's going through and you're listening to all the prophecy, he's saying that if you turn your back on me and go after strange gods, I'm going to do this, this, this. And you look and you read through the Old Testament, and every single one of those things happen. Right? He prophesied. The third aspect of being justified in the Spirit is absolute truth. Wisdom. Okay? Absolute truth and wisdom. Uh, the fourth, I'll even add a fourth, but the fourth is kind of like the first one. It's an act, a, outward showing, like a miracle, an outward physical showing. But we'll add the fourth one. Another justification of the Holy Spirit is He'll give you courage and strength. Courage and strength. He'll give you wisdom. There'll sometimes be outward showings, miracles. Moses did them. Okay. Um, outward showing miracles and prophecies. Okay. All those things justify the Spirit. That's, that Spirit's justified in you. Um, Joseph, when you turn to Genesis 41, verses 32 through 40. Remember, we're just talking about this right now. But Joseph, he's been sold by his brothers in Egypt. He's there. He gets, he, he's, uh, was sold to a captain first of the guard. Then he gets thrown in prison. And while he's in prison, there's two guys that have a dream. And he tells them their dream. Wisdom. Future prophecy tells them their dream. And it happened exactly like he told it would happen. The baker and the butler. Okay? Baker got hung. The butler got restored to his place. But the butler forgot him. Until the um, Pharaoh had a dream. And he had two dreams that were one. Remember, every time God mentions something more than once, it's because it's established. So the Bible says that. It's established. That's why. And, and Joseph, when you read that story, he tells him that. And at the, when he's done it, telling him what the dream means, seven years of plentifulness, then seven years of famine, and he tells Pharaoh that this is what you should do to save Egypt, Pharaoh looks at him and says, Is there anybody that we know that has the Spirit of God in him? The Spirit of God in him. Well, why would Pharaoh say that? Because he had wisdom. Wisdom like none like anybody else ever seen. He could tell the dream and prophesy the future. And did it come to pass? Yes, it did. He was justified in the spirit. And a heathen, pagan man saw it. Okay. Samson. Samson's a good uh, example of a physical manifestation of the Holy Spirit. 
Okay, the Spirit of God came upon him. It kept saying that. Uh, Judges 14, 5 and 6, Judges 14, 17 through 19, and Judges 15, 11 through 7. It talks about instances where the Spirit of God came upon him and he had strength of like 10 men. All through Judges, when God would raise somebody up, the Spirit of God would come upon him and he would have courage and strength to go fight for God's chosen people, to fight for the Lord God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, the God of Israel. They give them strength. Okay? They were justified in the Spirit. They would prophesy. Okay? Now Samson, just side note, Samson, when you're looking at Samson, he's an example of somebody who can lose their right standing with the Lord and get it back. He lost the Holy Spirit, but in the end he got it back. Okay? Uh, Saul, I believe that that's, uh, Samson is an example of somebody in the thousand year reign of Jesus Christ. It's all about works. Can you lose your right standing with Jesus Christ who's ruling and reigning as king? Absolutely. But we've already talked about a story where God will forgive them. Sometimes God will forgive you and you can have another, another uh, not another chance, but he forgives you. Okay, I'll say it. You get another chance. <laughs> you know, you can get it back. In other words, you can get back that right standing with the Lord. I believe Samson's a good example of somebody in the thousand year reign of Jesus Christ. Saul. Let's go to Saul. 1 Samuel 10, 1 through 13, we read about how uh, Samuel, who has the Holy Spirit in him, he prophesies. There's prophecy. And it comes true. But he prophesies to Saul about him being king, but talks about him when he's going on the way and this and that, and that you will come across these um, prophets and you'll start prophesying with them. And that's when Saul got the Holy Spirit, and it said he was, a, he was a new man from that day forward. He got the Holy Spirit. It's another example of a changed life. I mean, the Holy Spirit comes into you, and you get a changed life. Okay? He was justified in the Spirit. God had chosen Saul to be king, justified in the Spirit. Now, what did Saul do? He ended up failing the Lord multiple times. Became a people pleaser, fearing the people over fearing God, pleasing men over pleasing God. And he failed to the point where he lost the Holy Spirit. I believe Saul is a great example of someone in the time of Jacob's trouble. Saul lost the Holy Spirit and couldn't get it back. Now, I know one of the brethren asked the question, do you believe Saul was saved? We'll do that in another video. But um, Saul got the Holy Spirit and he lost it and he couldn't get it back. He's, a, he's an example of someone in the time of Jacob's trouble. You take the mark, you worship the beast, you lose the Holy Spirit. But going back to this study, justified in the Spirit, when Paul was uh, Samuel was prophesying, and God did great things through Samuel, gave him courage, gave him strength to fight for Israel, uh, he was justified in the Spirit. That's God's man. That's who God chose. Actually, the people wanted it. If you actually look into it, the people wanted it. God, Jesus Christ, which is the angel of the Lord, God manifest in the flesh, he was their king back then, and they rejected him. Uh, you fast forward a little bit to King David. And I know there's tons of people in the Bible, but you fast forward to King David. Okay, King David was also anointed to take the place of Saul when Saul fell. And the Holy Spirit of God came upon King David. Was there just, um, just, justification in the Spirit? Oh, yeah. He loved the Lord. He stood for the Lord. He did a, gave him strength and wisdom. And he took out Goliath. He fought for Israel a lot. He loved the Lord. I'm not going to put my hand for his anointed. There's so many times Saul almost got him and could have killed him. And, so, and God protected him. Okay. Was King David justified in the Spirit, the Holy Spirit, that he was the king that God chose after Saul? Oh, yeah. And then all through this, remember when uh, um, King David failed the Lord, committed adultery and murder, he sent a prophet to prophesy to him. And did that prophecy come to true? Yes. So the Holy Spirit was on that prophecy too, a prophet too. It's all justification. I'm just trying to go through this so when we get to the New Testament. There's outward showings, miracles, prophecy, wisdom, wisdom. Truth, know what the Bible says, buy the truth and sell it not, but also wisdom and instruction and understanding. Yeah, truth, absolute truth. 
when the Holy Spirit comes in. How we know this? Well, King David's son, Solomon, God, he asked for God for wisdom, and God poured out his spirit on him, and he was the wisest man ever. Next to Jesus, uh, below Jesus Christ, but as far as mankind, people that are sinners and wicked, he's the wisest man that ever lived. And the Bible says that it has lived or ever will live. Because Jesus is not, God, is not just a man like the rest of us. He's not a created being. He's God manifest in the flesh. Okay. But you see the Holy Spirit justification there. He's justified in the Spirit. Okay. Elijah. You go and look at the story of Elijah. There's so many times he did miracles. Miracle. Okay. All these miracles. And when he went to go up, Elijah, I see, Elisha, Elijah got to see him go up. Talk about justification. That was a man of God. Okay? Miracles, signs and wonders are justification of the Holy Spirit. And as soon as Elijah, I know it's talking about the spirit of Elijah, but what I believe it's really talking about is the Holy Spirit. You had Elijah and Elisha, and Elisha's like, poor, I want to be part of your spirit. But the spirit that Elisha really was seeing was the Holy Spirit in Elijah. And when he got that, whole, got that spirit, he took the mantle, and he hit the water, and the water parted. The Holy Spirit was now in Elijah. And Elijah continued the work that Eli, uh, Elisha was continuing the work that Elijah was doing. Okay. So... Brother Jesus Christ, when it says justification in the Spirit, that's what I believe. And we're going to get into the scriptures now. Because I didn't want this to be a five hour study. Because we could have gone hardcore in every little incident and everything. And I might in the past just do it a little bit here, a little bit there. I'm all for Bible studies. But, Brother and Sister in Christ, remember truth, absolute truth, knowledge. When the Holy Spirit comes in, it, gives, it, it brings you into all truth. We learn that in the New Testament. Okay? When the Comforter cometh, he'll bring you into all truth. That's what he did in the Old Testament. Prophecy. All truth. Prophecy. Signs and wonders. Courage and strength. Right. So let's see. This is talking about God manifest in the flesh and that he was justified in the Spirit. Well, first we're going to jump to the day of Pentecost. Acts chapter 2. Before we really get into Jesus Christ and the being justified in the Spirit. Let's talk about today being justified in the Spirit when it comes to signs and wonders, and we're going to talk about it a little bit. Acts 2, 1 through 21. Acts chapter 2, verse 1. And when the day of Pentecost was fully come, they were all with one accord in one place. And suddenly there came a sound from heaven as of a rushing mighty wind, and it filled all the house where they were sitting. And there appeared unto them cloven tongues like as a fire, and it sat upon each of them like as a fire. In other words, once again, the glory of the Lord was surrounding the Holy Spirit so someone could see some kind of a manifestation. But you can't see a spirit. If anybody says you can see a spirit, then they're calling Jesus a liar. The spirit hath not flesh and bones as you see me have. You can't see a spirit or a ghost. But when, uh, when, when God manifests the, his glory upon the Holy Spirit, and we're going to talk about some other incidences, especially with the, it coming down on Jesus, he does something, he puts his glory upon it. Then you can see the glory of the Lord. Verse 4, and they, because how do we know this is the Holy Ghost? The fire is the glory of the Lord, because you can't see the Spirit. But then it goes to verse 4, it says, And they were all filled with the Holy Ghost and began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. A sign, an outward showing, they're being justified in the Spirit. And there were dwelling at Jerusalem Jews, devout men out of every nation under heaven. Now when this was noised abroad, the multitude came together and were confounded because that every man heard them speak in his own language. It's not an unknown tongue. It's not a heavenly language. It's known tongues, but they're unknown to certain people. It's, if there was five people here speaking five different languages and one of them was speaking English, I know English. That's my tongue. 
But the other four speak in other languages. They're considered unknown tongues to me because I don't know those languages. But there was somebody there that did. And they were all amazed and marveled, saying one to another, Behold, are not all these which speak Galileans? And how hear we every man in our own tongue wherein we were born? Parthians and Medes, uh, Elamites, and the dwellers in Mesopotamia, and in Judea and Cappadocia, and Pontus and Asia, Phrygia and Pamphylia, and Egypt and in the parts of Libya, above Cyrene, about Cyrene, and strangers of Rome, Jews and proselytes, Cretes and Arabians, we do hear them speak in our own tongues, what? The wonderful works of God. The wonderful works of God. You know one of the justifications in the Spirit today for a Bible-believing, God-fearing man and woman is when God saves you and gives you a new life. I'm getting ahead of myself to change life. He gives you a new life. You can't help but tell your testimony to people. You can't, it just burns within you to tell your family members and your friends, your co-workers, your neighbors about the wonderful things that God has done for you, how he died for your sins. Yeah, it's one of the justifications of spirits. When you get someone who says, well, I'm saved, and they hate preaching the plan of salvation, they hate, I mean, I've gotten people online that when I hit them up, because I want to know if they're real, I just say, hey, what's your testimony? They get mad at me. Why would you get mad at me just to tell me your testimony when someone asks for your testimony? You don't think I'm saved. I'm asking for your testimony. Why aren't you jumping up and down saying, I want to tell you my testimony. I want to tell you what God did for me. Yeah. Verse 12. And they were all amazed and were in doubting, saying some to another, what meaneth this? And you get that attitude. You can come to brethren, I don't brother, sorry, brothers and sisters and family members, moms, dads, uncles, and they can steal your joy. They can totally destroy your joy. Oh, you're just full of it. Oh, you're just part of an occult. Oh, you're just, you know, it'll pass, you know. You're just, you know, kind of high on something and it'll pass. That can really steal your joy. That God has given you that, that joy of salvation. Others mocked, said, These men are full of new wine. But Peter, standing up with the eleven, lifted up his voice and said unto them, Ye men of Judea, and all ye that, were, that dwell at Jerusalem, be this known unto you, and hearken to my words. For these are not drunken, as ye suppose, seeing it is but the third hour of the day. But this is that which was spoken by the prophet Joel. Notice he says it's but the third hour of the day. Remember, their days was 6 to 6. So it's 9 in the evening, so you think today, well, that's when people try to them, it's the new day. It's only the third hour of the day. Okay. Verse 17, And it shall come to pass in the last day, saith God, I will pour out my Spirit upon all flesh, and your sons and your daughters shall prophesy, and your young men shall see visions, and your old men shall dream dreams. And on my servants and on my handmaidens I will pour out in those days of my spirit, and they shall prophesy. And I will show wonders in heaven above, and signs in earth beneath, blood, fire, and vapor, and smoke. The sun shall be turned into darkness, and the moon into blood, before the great and notable day of the Lord come. And it shall come to pass that whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. It's salvation at the reach. And they're talking about the time of Jacob's trouble there. We were getting into the time of Jacob's trouble a little bit. Okay. Um, remember, if you want to turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 17. They were justified in the Spirit. There were signs and wonders there. They had a love of salvation that they were, trying, they were preaching the wonderful things that God did for them, saved them. They're preaching, I believe that they were preaching the gospel in all these languages. Plan of salvation. And some people marveled and some people mocked them. It's going to happen to you, brothers and sisters of Christ. Especially if you're newly saved, don't get discouraged. You're going to have people that mock you and try to steal that joy of salvation from you. Just keep going. 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 17. For Christ sent me not to baptize, but to preach the gospel... And he's talking about water baptism. But to preach the gospel, not with wisdom of words, it can also be talking about both. Let me stop that. He can be talking about both, because I can't 
uh, Holy Ghost baptizing anybody. That's the Lord. The Lord's the one who saves, not me. But I'm just saying, he's also saying water baptism, Holy Ghost baptism. Water baptism is outward showing Holy Ghost. I didn't come to baptize, but to preach the gospel. Not with wisdom of words, lest the cross of Christ should be made of none effect. In other words, the wisdom comes from the Lord, the Holy Spirit. For the preaching of the cross is to them that perish foolishness, but to un unto us which are saved it is the power of God. For it is written, I will destroy them in the wisdom of the wise, I will bring to nothing the understanding of the prudent. Where is the wise? Where is the scribe? Where is the disputer of this world? Hath not God made foolish the wisdom of this world? My biggest thing is, is being justified in the Spirit. What's people's attitude towards the King James Bible? It's God's perfect written word in English. Do they add to it? Do they subtract it? Do they try to correct it? Or do they trust it and believe in it fully, even if they don't understand certain? There's some passages I still, God hasn't shown me the answers yet. There's some things about the Bible I don't understand. But I have faith, and I believe in it. But the wisdom of this world tries to turn you against the Word of God. The wisdom of this world tries to get you to doubt your salvation. Sometimes there are false converts that the Word of God and brethren through the Holy Spirit can get you to doubt your salvation because you might not be saved. They can get you to doubt your salvation because you've lost your way. And it's not that you're lost. You just need to have that fear to get back on the right path. But the wisdom of the world is always, always going to try to get you to doubt your salvation and to get you to just fall away so you're not abounding in the work of the Lord. 21. For after that, in the wisdom of God, the world by wisdom knew not God. It pleased God by the foolishness of the preaching to save them that believe. For the Jews require a what? A sign. And the Greeks seek after wisdom. The Bible talks about knowledge puffeth up. The Greeks seek for wisdom, but they're seeking for the world's wisdom. They're seeking for wisdom in all the wrong places. You want true wisdom? Get saved. The Holy Spirit's the only thing that's going to bring true wisdom in a man's life. A man or woman's life. Verse 23. But we preach Christ crucified unto the Jews a stumbling block. Why? Because they require a sign. They require signs. That's why it's stumbling block. And unto the Greeks, foolishness. Why? Because Greeks seek after wisdom and they're looking at the wisdom of the world. And God has made foolish the wisdom of the world. What's one of the signs of being justified in the Spirit? Signs and wonders for the Jewish people. What's one of the signs of uh, uh, being justified in the Spirit as a Christian today? We have absolute truth. We are not without hope in the world. We're not without God and we're not without hope in the world. We have absolute truth. We got precious promises. But to the Greeks, overall, it's foolishness. But unto them which are called, both Jews and Greeks, Christ the power of God and the wisdom of God. The Holy Spirit. God gives us the Holy Spirit. We read how He's going to pour out His Holy Spirit on everyone that believes, repents, and believes that God saves. God baptized with the Holy, with the Holy Ghost. Okay. God manifest in the flesh equals Jesus Christ in the likeness of sinful flesh. But justified in the Spirit, that's what we're going to be talking about. But before we do this, I want to make one good point here. The signs and wonders are done away with. People, oh, oh, and that's going to upset a lot of people. Okay, I'm just going to go with this real quick. Paul, there was three times that he goes to the Jewish people, and three times the Jewish people reject. Remember we just read there, the signs and wonders were for the Jewish people. Why is it a stumbling block? Because they just can't have simple faith. That's the summing block. They've got to see a sign. They've got to see a sign. And, and like I said, with the, gent, um, with the Greeks, the wisdom of this world keeps coming in and prevents them from having simple faith and believing. The wisdom of this world just totally just messes with people. And we see it today. But the signs and wonders were for the Jewish people. And he went three times. And the third time was in Rome. When he's, he's been taken to Rome. The third time was in Rome. And I can't remember if it was the first time and the third time or all three times, but he said the first time and the third time that I'm just going to go to the Gentiles. I'm done with the Jews. I'm going to the Gentiles. But when he was moved to a new area where there was new Jews that didn't hear, never heard about Jesus Christ, his love for his people, he went and preached to them again anyway. And then they reject him. Well, and he gets so frustrated. Well, I'm done. I'm done with you. 
and he goes, I'm only going to the Gentiles. But the third time, when he does that, the sign gifts disappear. He can no longer heal himself. There was a brother in Christ that he tells Timothy to pick him up along the way because he was sick. He was unable to heal him. The signs and wonders are done away with. Why? Because they're for the Jews. And when the Jews had their three chances, I always do this three, not because I'm trying to promote baseball or anything, but I've always done the three strikes and you're out. He went to the Jews three times. They denied Jesus Christ as a whole three times. There were some Jews that got saved, but as a nation, they rejected Jesus Christ again three times as their king. That's why you got to be careful with the book of Acts. It's a transition book. I just had to make that point. But one of the uh, manifestations of justification of the Spirit is signs and wonders. The other is absolute truth. Love of the truth. And the first truth that you're going to have is your testimony. You're going to start preaching the true plan of salvation and what God did for you in the changed life. You're just going to have a love of it. But justified in the spirit, God was manifest in the flesh equals Jesus Christ in the likeness of sinful flesh. We talked about this. But what does it mean to be justified in the spirit? We've basically gone over it just talking, just talking about stuff in the Old Testament. We looked at some scriptures. But now let's look at the life of Jesus Christ. Actually, we're going to do a little bit before. Turn to Luke, verse 1. We're going to go to Luke, chapter 1. I'm a very bad page turner. <laughs> Luke chapter 1. That's how I should be turning. Sorry about that. Uh, Luke chapter 1, verse 13. But the angel said unto him, Fear not, Zacharias, for thy prayer is heard, and thy wife Elizabeth shall bear thee a son, and thou shalt call his name John, and thou shalt have joy and gladness, and many shall rejoice at his birth. And he shall be great in the sight of the Lord, and shall drink neither wine nor strong drink. And he shall be filled with the Holy Ghost, even from his mother's womb. And many of the children of Israel shall, turn, shall he turn to the Lord their God. There's the justification of the Spirit. He turned a lot of people to the Lord their God. A lot of the poor people. And then he challenged the Sadducees, scribes, and Pharisees. Verse 17, And he shall go before him in the spirit and the power of Elias to turn the hearts of the fathers to the children and the disobedient to the wisdom of the just. John the Baptist had wisdom. To make ready a people prepared for the Lord. He's preparing the way of the Lord. But why did I emphasize that even from his mother's womb? That right there disproves Peter Ruckman. That verse alone disproves Peter Ruckman. In order, remember, in order to be a person, you have to have a body, a soul, and it's always referred to someone living. Always referred to someone living. In order to have the Holy Spirit of God on you, you've got to be a person. Body, soul, and spirit. The moment John was conceived, he was given the Holy Spirit. I'm sorry, we're going to read a little bit more. It could be the moment he was conceived or part through his conception, but bottom line, it's in the womb. The babe's in the womb. It's a person. Peter Ruffin was, I, and I could be completely wrong, but when I looked at some of his teachings, he taught that it wasn't a person until it came out of the womb and was breathing his own air and no longer having to breathe through his mother or eat through his mother. He was just out in the open. Then he's a person. We just read there, if he's not a person before, if a baby's not a person, it's just just thing. How can it have the Holy Ghost on it? And John the Baptist wasn't the only one. I believe Jesus Christ was born with the Holy Spirit. And I'll show you why. Okay. But there we have John the Baptist. Why is that important? John the Baptist was born with the Holy Spirit. And he had wisdom. Okay, He was preaching to the people to turn people back to God. He was justified in the Spirit that God had chose him to come before Jesus Christ. God manifests in the flesh. Luke 1.41 Turn to Luke 141. And it came to pass 
that when Elizabeth heard the salutation of Mary, the babe leapt in her womb, and Elizabeth was filled with the Holy Ghost. Like I said, it said that the child would have the Holy Ghost from his womb, in his mother's womb. I believe it was at conception. God put the Holy Spirit on him. But here's the example. The child, this is John the Baptist, that's in Elizabeth, his mother's womb, the Holy Ghost that's on him, now comes upon her. Why? Because Mary was there with Jesus in her stomach. With child. Remember, the, saying, the proper saying is with child. You need, if you're still using the word pregnant, you need to get that out of your vocabulary. That's satanic, that's wicked. That's the wisdom of this world to try to justify murder. It's with child. There is a child in that woman on the moment of conception. And Elizabeth was filled with the Holy Ghost, and she spake out with a loud voice, and said, Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb. And whence is this to me, that the mother of my Lord should come to me? For lo, as soon as the voice of thy salutation sounded in my ears, the babe leapt in my womb for joy. John the Baptist had the Holy Spirit from his mother's womb. He was born with the Holy Spirit. That, uh, we could do a whole teaching on that, but that in itself is all you should need to know that, hey, that is a child, body, soul, and spirit at the moment of conception. Okay? You've had an abortion, you've committed murder. Can God forgive you? Absolutely. Paul had his hands were bloody. God forgave him and used him. Learn from that mistake, don't make that mistake again, and get to serving the Lord and living for the Lord every day. But don't tell me it's not murder. I said, P. Ruckman had it wrong. Brother Ruckman had it wrong. Big time. Okay. Jesus born with the Holy Spirit in him. Why do I believe Jesus was born with the Holy Spirit in him? Turn to Matthew 1, 18, 25. Matthew chapter 1, verse 18. Now the birth of Jesus Christ was on this wise, when as his mother Mary was espoused to Joseph before they came together, she was found with child of the Holy Ghost. Then Joseph, her husband, being a just man and not willing to make her a public example, was minded to put her away privily. Now remember what um, uh, Elizabeth said, the my Lord, the mother of my capital L Lord. If that's God manifest in the flesh and inside her it's got to have a body, soul, spirit. God the Father is in him, and he's seated in heaven. How does that work? Great is the mystery of godliness. Jesus is the body, and he has a spirit, and that spirit's the spirit of God. What's the spirit of God? The Holy Ghost, also known as the Holy Spirit. But while he thought on these things, behold, the angel... I'm sorry, verse 19. Then... Joseph, her husband, being a just man and not willing to make her a public example, was minded to put her away privily. But while he thought on these things, behold, the angel of the Lord appeared unto him in a dream, saying, Joseph, thou son of David, fear not to take unto thee Mary thy wife, for that which is conceived in her is of the Holy Ghost. Of. There's connection. Verse 21. And she shall bring forth a son, and thou shalt call his name Jesus. For he shall save his people from their sins. Now all this was done that it might be fulfilled which was spoken of the Lord by the prophets. This is prophecy coming true. This is those prophets being justified. Sometimes it takes a long time. You have remember Jesus, he 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 fulfilled a lot of Old Testament prophecy. He didn't fill all of it. Why? Because the Jewish people put him uh, rejected him as their king again. Remember, I believe they rejected him in the Old Testament. They rejected him again, and he came as one of them in the likeness of sinful flesh, and they rejected him. Mm -hmm. But sometimes prophecies take a while. When, when the time of Jacob's trouble comes on, those prophets are going to be justified in the Spirit. That prophesied the uh, time of Jacob's trouble. When the thousand-year reign comes along, those prophets are going to be justified in the Spirit that prophesied about the millennial kingdom, the thousand-year reign of Jesus Christ. But here we see those prophets being justified by the Spirit. Spoke to the Lord by the prophet, saying, Behold, a virgin shall be with child, and shall bring forth a son, 
and they shall call his name Emmanuel, which being interpreted is God with us. Then Joseph, being raised from sleep, did as the angel of the Lord had commanded him, and took him, took unto him his wife. Once again, you have the angel of the Lord, that's Jesus, talking to him. But then Jesus is in the box. How is that possible? Great is the mystery of godliness. I can only tell you what it is. Jesus is God manifest in the likeness of sinful flesh. Likeness of sinful flesh. Angel of the Lord. Right. How's it work? Great is the mystery of godliness. We'll have to fi we'll find out when we get to heaven, and we'll be of one mind. But people say, well, that yeah, it just means he was conceived by the Holy Spirit. I thought I'd, I kept telling myself to put this in my notes, put it in my notes, and I keep, and I didn't. But do you guys remember the story, if you keep going, about Jesus' life when he was a kid? And how he se got separated from his parents, and he was in the synagogue, and he was asking all these questions, and the people, and these uh, people that have been, uh, I don't want to say the rabbis, because call no man rabbi, uh, they are elders that have studied the scriptures, and they marveled at the wisdom of this little child and the questions that he was asking. That's because he had the Holy Spirit in him. The Spirit of God was in Jesus Christ. I believe it was from birth. Okay? That's very important to understand. But then people say, well then how did he receive the Holy Spirit? The Holy Spirit can be in more than one place at once. Do you have the Holy Spirit in you, brother? Sister? Well, I got it in me. Well, then how can it be in me and be in you at the same time? Great is the mystery of godliness. I just know that it's a fact that if you're truly saved and born again, the Holy Spirit's just as much as in you as it is in me. It's that simple. Can the Holy Spirit be in more place than one? Could it already be in Him and then there be a manifestation? I'm getting ahead of myself. Yes. Can God the Father be sitting on the throne in heaven, the soul, and be in Christ, the God, God which says God in Christ in the Bible. God the Father, you say you're adding the Father. Well, 1 Corinthians 8, 6 says there's only one capital G, the Father. So when you see capital G, God was in Christ. It's not God the Son, it's God the Father who is in the Son, the soul. There's connection. Jesus had the Holy Spirit in him. Now, let's go ahead, since we talk talking about let's get to that story about John being justified in the Spirit. When he's sitting there as a little kid, that's justification of the Spirit because there was wisdom that a little kid like that should never have had. It's not something like, well, he's just repeating what my parents said. He had wisdom that, kid, that no kid that age has. Are you tell me that wasn't justification of the Spirit? Remember what's one of the justifications of the Spirit for a Christian today? The Holy Spirit will come in and bring you into all truth. Your love of the Word. You hide it in your heart. You live it. Justification of the Spirit. Mm -hmm. uh, John chapter 1, verse 26. John answered them, saying, I baptize with water, but there standeth one among you whom ye know not. He it is whom coming after me is preferred before me, whose shoes latch it I am not worthy to unloose. Remember? It was prophesied that he would prepare the way of the Lord. Those prophets are being justified in the Spirit. Verse 28. These things were done in... I'm sorry. His shoes, I'm over there. These things were done in Bethbara, Beth, Beth beyond Jordan, where John was baptizing. The next day John seeth Jesus coming unto him and saith, Behold, the Lamb of God. The Holy Spirit shows him that that's the Lamb of God. Behold, the Lamb of God, which taketh away the sins of the world. You know one of the things, ways we're justified in the Spirit, brother, and sister Christ? When you are, the Bible says that we are now ambassadors for Jesus Christ. We, have, we were given the ministry of reconciliation. When we point people to the real Jesus Christ of Scripture. You know how we can tell people that aren't justified in the Spirit? When they point people to another Christ. An antichrist. Paul talked about this. If anybody preach another gospel which we have not preached, another Jesus which we have not pre ble preached, or get them to receive another spirit which we have not received, that Antichrist spirit, 
they might well bear with him. And who's the him? Satan. They're going to go to hell and burn for all eternity because they're worshiping the wrong Jesus. That's why people get onto you. You just say these people are lost. Why? Because they hate the King James Bible. They didn't get saved off the plan of salvation. They don't believe in the real Jesus Christ. They're messed up doctrinally. So on and so forth. And you've got a lot of fakes and frauds that are trying to act like us. But the point is, is being justified in the Spirit is when you're pointing people to the real Jesus Christ of Scripture. True plan of salvation. The change life gospel. The resurrection gospel. The life living resurrection gospel. Verse 30. This is he of whom I said, After me cometh the man which is preferred before me, for he was before me. Wait, wait, he was before him? John was born first. John's, John the Baptist is older than Jesus Christ when it comes to the likeness of sinful flesh and the body that he's in right now. But he said, was before me? Once again, this is John saying that Jesus is God fully and completely. That he was there in the Old Testament. And you still have people denying that Jesus had a body in the Old Testament. He is the body of God. Verse 31, And I knew him not, but that he should be made manifest to Israel before, therefore am I come baptizing with water. And John bear record, John bear record, saying, I saw the Spirit descending from heaven like a dove, and it abode upon him. Only John saw that. And we've talked about this before. I believe it was a cloud that came down, the glory of the Lord surrounding the Holy Spirit coming down, and it came down in the shape and acted like the way a dove does when it lands. Look at some videos on how doves land when they come to land down on the ground. Okay. But it's a cloud. It's the glory of the Lord. The Holy Spirit is already in him, yet it comes down on him. How is that possible? Great is the mystery of godliness. But to John the Baptist, that was a sign. Jesus being justified in the Spirit. And John the Baptist told people of what he saw. Nobody else saw it, just John. Verse 33, And I knew him not, but he that sent me to baptize with water... Uh, go back to 32 again. And John bare record, saying, I saw the Spirit descend from heaven like a dove, and it abode upon him. Like a dove, and it abode upon him. And I knew him not, but he that sent me to baptize with water, the same said unto me, Upon whom thou shalt see the Spirit descending and remaining on him, prophecy, the same is, is he which baptized with the Holy Ghost. It's prophecy. Excuse me, it's really hot out here. Uh, verse 34, And I saw, once again, John the Baptist, and bear record that this is the Son of God, capital S, Son of God, God manifest in the flesh. He was before me. Why is this so important? He was justified by a sign for John. But why was that important? Because let's look at what John does next. Some people kind of miss this. I miss this. But think about it. Look what John does next. Verse 35, Again the next day after John stood and two of his disciples, and looking upon Jesus as he walked, he said, Behold the Lamb of God. He's pointing people, those two disciples, he's pointing them to God manifest in the flesh. Is that what we're supposed to do today, brothers and sisters of Christ? Are we supposed to point people to Jesus Christ as the solution to all their problems? Amen. Verse 37, And the two disciples heard him speak, and they followed Jesus. Which what, let's, let's, let's read what one of those disciples, who one of those disciples were. Then Jesus turned and saw them following, and said unto them, What seek ye? They said unto him, Rabbi, which is to be say, being interpreted master, Where dwellest thou? He saith unto them, Come and see. They came and saw where he dwelt, and abode with him that day, for it was about the tenth hour. And one of the two which heard John speak and followed him was Andrew, Simon Peter's brother. Pretty amazing. God used John to point people to Jesus Christ. Prepare ye the way for Jesus Christ. That was one of the ways Jesus was justified in the Spirit. Signs and wonders, prophecy, okay? 
the sign was for John, and he was able to present that sign that he saw, and he was able to lead two people to Jesus Christ. They went and followed Jesus Christ. I turn to Matthew chapter 3, verse 11. Matthew 3, 11. I indeed baptize you with water unto repentance. Remember, it was an open, it's just a sign for the Jewish people. It's an open thing. It's a sign. It's a, uh, but then he says, But he that cometh after me is mightier than I, whose shoes I am not worthy to bear. He shall baptize you with the Holy Ghost and with fire, whose fan is in his hand, and he will thoroughly purge his floor and gather his wheat into the garner, but he will burn up the chaff with uncrenchable fire. And if you read the story, Jesus never baptized anybody. Water baptism. Why? Because he was going to end up baptizing those who would come to him after his death, burial, and resurrection with the Holy Ghost. Physical baptism is not a requirement. The water baptism, I mean, is not a requirement for salvation. Holy Ghost baptism is. Mm -hmm. What happened in Matthew 4, 1? Then was Jesus led up into the of the spirit into the wilderness to be tempted of the devil. And then you go through the stories where he's tempted. The Holy Spirit, they say, well, he only came down on him right then and there. No. He always had the Holy Spirit. We talked about when he was a child, he had wisdom that the Holy Spirit gives us. The wisdom that only God can have. Now, sign gifts of the Holy Spirit. He gave some of those sign gifts of the Holy Spirit. When you go through Jesus' life, he's healing people. He's casting out devils. He's raising people from the dead. He walked on water. He fed the 5,000 and the 4,000 with uh, a few loaves of bread. I think one was seven loaves, the other one was three. Okay. Matthew 10, verse 1 says, And when they had called unto him his twelve disciples, and when he had called unto him his twelve disciples, he gave them power against unclean spirits to cast them out. And he healed all manner of sickness and all manner of disease. He gave them the signs of the Holy Spirit. And did it continue in Acts? Absolutely. Why? Because the Jews require a sign. But once again, it's a manifestation of justification of the Spirit. These are the twelve disciples disciples that Jesus had chosen. Turn to Luke chapter 7. Luke seven nineteen. And John calling unto him two of his disciples sent them to Jesus saying, Art thou he that should come? God manifest in the flesh to save the sins, save the Jewish people from the sin, their sins, to be the king of kings, capital K, king of kings. Or look we for another. When the men were come unto him, they said, John the Baptist has sent us unto thee, saying, Art thou he that should come, or look we for another? And in the same hour he cured many of their infirmities and plagues and of evil spirits, and unto many that were blind he gave sight. Then Jesus answered and said unto them, Go your way and tell John what things ye have seen and heard, how that the blind see, manifestation of the Spirit, justification of the Spirit, the blind see, the lame walk, the lepers are cleansed, the deaf hear, the dead are raised. The poor, to the poor the gospel is preached. And blessed is he whoever shall not be offended in me. Justification in the Spirit. The signs and wonders that Jesus did was justification in the Spirit. This is God manifest in the flesh. I mean, he walked on water. Okay. Um, prophecy. You don't have to turn here because we've already talked about it a little bit. But 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 21 says, For the prophets came not in old time by the will of man, but holy men of God spake as they were moved by the Holy Ghost. And we saw some of those prophecies where they were justified, it takes years down the road, they are justified in the Spirit. If you believe in God, you trust Him on the spot, but some people, they've got to see it come to pass for them to believe. 
but they're justified in the spirit. Isaiah 7, 14. This is what it was talking about when it comes to virgin being born of a virgin Mary. Jesus being born of a virgin Mary. Isaiah 7, 14 says, Therefore the Lord himself shall give you a sign. Behold, a virgin shall conceive and bear a son and shall call his name Emmanuel. Isaiah 53, 5 says, But he was wounded for our transgression. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon him, and with his stripes we are healed. You mean his death, burial, and resurrection were prophesied? Yeah. Justified in the Spirit. And what does the Bible say? Because we always talk, I always talk about this because the Trinitarians can't handle it. The pagan Trinitarians. And people that I believe, I'm, don't get me wrong, I believe some people are saved. They believe the Godhead of the King James Bible, but they can't let go of paganism. They can't let go of Catholicism, and they still hold on to the Trini Trinity terms. The Trinity people can't handle that God the Father raised Jesus from the get dead. Jesus said he'd raise himself from the dead. But for this study being justified in the Spirit, it says he was put to death in the flesh, but what? Quickened by the Spirit. The ultimate justification that this is God manifest in the flesh is that he, he died for the sins of the world, was buried, and he rose again the third day. And the Holy Spirit had a part in that. The Godhead raised him from the dead. Mm -hmm. Now, John, I want to read this real quick. John 14, 1 through 18. Well, what can we get from this today? Okay, John 14, uh, 1 through 8. I'm going to keep doing that. Let's see. see if I got this right. 14, 1 through 18. Let not your heart be troubled. Ye believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. Prophecy. When we get to heaven, that prophecy is going to come true. I trust the Lord. But when we see that, is that another justify, being justified in the Spirit when we get there? Oh yeah. I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go to prepare a place for you, I will come again, come again, and receive you unto myself. The catching away of the body of Christ. Another promise. That blessed hope. Do you believe in that blessed hope, brother and sister Christ? Well, when that happens, it's another justification of the Spirit. And that where I am, there you, you may be also. And whether I go, you know, and the way you know. Thomas saith, unto him, Lord, we know not whether thou goest, and how can we know the way? How can we know the way? God, Jesus, the body, is leaving. You read about that, how he's caught up. I think that's Acts 1. He's caught up. Verse 6, Jesus saith unto him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh to the Father but by me. If ye had known me, ye should have known my Father also, and from henceforth ye know him, and have seen him. Philip saith unto him, show, Lord, show us the Father, and it sufficeth of us. Jesus saith unto him, Have I been so long time with you, and yet hast thou not known me, Philip? He that hath seen me hath seen the Father, and how saith thou then, Show us the Father? Believeth not that I am in the Father, and the Father in me? The words that I speak unto you, I speak not of myself, but the Father that dwelleth in me, he doeth the work. Believe me that I am in the Father, and the Father in me, or else believe me for the works' sake. Justification of the Spirit, the signs, the wonders, the ultimate sacrifice, death, burial, and the resurrection. Works' sake. Verily, verily, I say unto you, he that believeth on me, the works that I shall do, shall he do also, and greater works than these shall he do, because I go unto my Father. And whatsoever ye shall ask in my name, that will I do, that the Father may be glorified in the Son. Now one of the biggest things I like to say is, is when he's talking there, they did some do some signs and wonders, uh, Pentecost, and in the early book of Acts. But I think what he's really talking about here is when the two witnesses come back in the time of Jacob's trouble. It talks about some amazing wonders and signs. It goes back to some of the signs in Egypt that Moses did, because Moses is one of the witnesses. And you have Elijah, all those signs and wonders that Elijah did, showing that he was justified in the Spirit. He's God's man. Right. 
If ye, if ye shall ask anything in my name, I will do it. If ye love me, keep my commandments. You know, one, this is the justification of the Spirit, that someone has the Holy Spirit in them, is that they love God, and loving God, Jesus Christ, is you do your best to keep God's commandments. And I'm not talking about necessarily the Ten Commandments. I'm talking about a study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needs not to be shamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. That's a command. That's one of the commandments. Abstain from all appearance of evil. That's one of the commandments. And there's so many more. Be not, be not, uh, be, you're not supposed to be drunken. You're not supposed to be a fornicator. Such were some of you. There's a lot of commands. The biggest one is obeying the gospel. Verse 16, And I will pray the Father, and he shall give you another comforter. Stop right there. Did you hear what he just said? Another comforter. Why did I read this whole section? Because at the top, he's talking about how he's going to go away. The body comes up. What does he send? He sends another comforter. So who was the first comforter? Jesus Christ. Who's the other comforter? And he shall give you another comforter that he may abide with you forever. How's that for a promise, brother says Christ? We get changed in the moment in the twinkle of an eye. This corruption must put on incorruption. This mortality must put on immortality. We still get to keep the Holy Spirit. It is with us forever. Verse 17, Even the Spirit of truth, whom the world cannot receive, because he seeth him not, neither knoweth him, but ye know him, for he dwelleth in you and shall be in you. I'm sorry, for he dwelleth with you, Jesus Christ, and shall be in you, the Holy Spirit at Pentecost. And that day forward. Verse 18, I will not leave you comfortless, I will come to you. Then he talks about the Holy Spirit. Okay. And then it talks about what the Holy Spirit heareth, that shall he speak. And he'll guide you into all truth. Let's see how far we're going to go. So let's go to 18. Here it is. Let's go jump down to 26. But the Comforter, which is the Holy Ghost, that's how we know the second Comforter, the another Comforter is the Holy Ghost, whom the Father will send in my name, he shall teach you all things and bring all things to your remembrance whatsoever I have said unto you. Peace I leave with you, my peace I give unto you, not as the world giveth, give I unto you. Let not your heart be troubled, neither let it be afraid. Remember what we talked about in the Old Testament? What's one of the uh, justifications of the Spirit? That you have the Holy Spirit? Is things can be falling apart out here. Completely and utterly falling apart out here. And God will give you peace. He'll give you courage. He'll give you strength. Remember what the Bible says. We're not given a spirit of fear, but of love and peace and a sound mind. A sound mind. Bring it into all truth. Jesus, he's sitting in the garden and he's praying, Lord, if it be your if it be possible, take this cup from me, but not my will, your will. And he went to the cross. People say, well, he was scared. Well, no, he was showing us that there was no other way. He knew he had to do that. He knew it was the only way. So why did he pray that prayer? He did it for our benefit. So people can't come along and try to deceive you and say, well, it could have been done another way. Or he, he could have been just strangled. Or he could have been... They're liars. They're deceivers. He had to bleed. He had to go through what he went through on the cross. All the blood poured out. Sacrifice to take on the sins of the world. It had to happen that way. But guiding you into all truth, the Holy Spirit is. And Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. Go back through and read some of the parables that Jesus told. The wisdom that he had. How he could hear people's hearts. What was on their heart. Remember we talked about in Job how he was worried about his children. They look good. They look like they're godly. They're, they love God and they look righteous and everything. But perhaps they curse God in their hearts. I can't see the heart of you, brother and sister in Christ. But God can. Another justification of the Spirit. Okay. Uh, Matthew 16. Turn to Matthew 16. Lord, I felt that breeze. This is the one that matters. <laughs> Matthew 16, verse 
Matthew 16. I felt that breeze. It felt good, but it blew my notes everywhere. Matthew 16. We're almost done. Matthew 16, 13 through 17. Let's get to 13. When Jesus came into the coast of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, saying, Whom do men say that I, the Son of Man, the Son of Man am? Now, remember we read, Jesus is the first comforter. Okay. The Holy Spirit's in him. And they said, Some say that thou art John the Baptist, some Elias, and others Jeremiah, or one of the prophets. He saith unto them, But whom say ye that I am? And Simon Peter answered and said, Thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. God manifest in the flesh. King of kings. Our King. Our Savior. Verse 17, And Jesus answered and said unto him, Blessed art thou, Simon Barjona, for flesh and blood hath not revealed it unto thee, but my Father which is in heaven. God the Father is in the soul, is the soul that's inside Jesus Christ, and he has the Holy Spirit in him. He's the way, the truth, and the life. John was with, uh, sorry John, P Peter was with Jesus long enough to see the justification of the Spirit. And God showed him the truth. So Jesus is the first comforter, and he's going to send the Holy Spirit, another comforter for us. Okay? This is also repeated in Mark 8, 27. Remember when God does something more than once, it's because it's established? God the Father, through Jesus Christ, the signs, the wonders, his preaching, the knowledge, the teachings, showed Peter that thou art the Son of God, the Son of the living God. Thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. Once again, someone else was able to point Jesus out. That's him. That's God. Manifest in the flesh. Not a third of God. Not the second member of God. Or the second person of the Trinity. That's God fully and completely. Uh, John 14, 17. John 14, 17. Even the Spirit of truth, whom ye the world cannot receive, because it seeth him not, neither knoweth him, but ye know him, for he dwelleth with you, and shall be in you. Remember what we read there? He shall be with you. Jesus is the first comforter. That's how John, or P, uh, Paul, if I can get, no, I can't even get right. Peter, it's getting hot out here. Peter could see that that's God manifest in the flesh, because the first comforter is Jesus Christ. That's why Jesus is referred to as the capital W Word. The spoken word. He speaks, God speaking. And you have the Holy Spirit that gave us his written word, lowercase w word. And do you believe that, you ask me, do I believe this is Holy Go inspired by the Holy Ghost? This is God's perfect written word? Yes, it is. Fully and completely. And I pray, brothers and sisters in Christ, if you haven't come to that fully and completely where this is God's word, no doubt, I don't care what anybody says, there's things in here that I'm not going to understand, Lord, but the Bible says I'm supposed to pray and ask for understanding, ask for wisdom, and you give it to all men liberally. Lord, if I don't understand it, show it to me. But whatever happens, no matter what happens, don't ever let me doubt this book. This is your perfect written word. John 14, 6, Jesus saith unto him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh to the Father but by me. I am the way, the truth, and the life. Then he talks about the Holy Spirit coming in, and he will bring you into all truth. Okay. Jesus was justified in the Spirit. There was, so, there was just so much evidence, justification. What I mean by evidence is justification of the Spirit, the Spirit of God being justified time and time again when you read the Gospels. He's fulfilling prophecy. He's doing miracles, raising people from the dead, walking on water, feeding the thousand. The wisdom that he had, I believe, was greater than Solomon. But once again, he's God manifest in the flesh. He had the Holy Spirit in him. Now, what, what I want to leave with you, brother, sister in Christ, is justification of the Spirit for a Christian today. Signs and wonders are gone. But what would be a justification of the Spirit in a of this Holy Spirit in a Christian today. Well, the first one is love of the truth. God opening the scriptures to you. When a brother in Christ comes to me and says, hey, look what God showed me, and I look at it and go, wow, the Holy Spirit in me bears record with the Holy Spirit in him. That's absolute truth. And on the flip side, there's people that come to you and say, well, you know, uh, 
there's no repentance. It's, 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 repentance is just going from unbelief to belief. And you go chapter and verse, and they can't show chapter and verse. Or they'll try to twist scripture, and you look at it, and the Holy Spirit in you goes, wait a second, that person's in error. And you study it, though. If someone comes to me and says something that's just really crazy, and I've already studied it, I'll be like, you're lying, I've already studied it. But if someone comes to me with something and says, you know, let's do what would come over the flat earth. When the first person I ever came up with flat earth, I was like, well, at first I didn't look into it. But then God convicted me saying, hey, look into it. So I looked into flat earth, and I looked into round, uh, globe sphere earth, okay? You look into things. You want the truth. You have a love of the truth. You can't get enough of the truth. My testimony when I got saved, you know what the biggest things was? I couldn't get enough of the truth. I started going through every video that King James Video Ministries had. I started going through every video that uh, Chick Publications had. I went through some of uh, Sam Gibbs' videos. Like I said, I can't support King James, uh, Chick Publications anymore, present tense. And I can't support Sam Gibb, present tense. But at the time, in the past, before they really, really just utterly fell away or just wouldn't, they're above correction. Um, but the point is, is I had such a love of the truth. I was watching Bible study after Bible study. The Bible study started getting in the way of my video game playing and my movie playing, but I didn't care. My movies, TV shows, video games, my fun, flesh fun, it started getting in the way of that, but I didn't care. I had such a love of the truth. When you have people that say, this is a nice translation, but I, don't, I prefer these other Bibles, they don't have a love of the truth. That's a strike to me. That's, that's a red flag. That's a warning bell signing off. Something's not right with this man or woman. If they don't love God's perfect written word and have such a love of the truth that... I've told you in my testimony, you know what led me to Christ? The true plan of salvation, the real Jesus Christ? Someone told me about the Bible version issue. And I started studying the Bible version issue. What does the Bible say? Buy the truth and sell it not. Also, wisdom, instruction, and understanding. You buy it with your time. You have to study. Love of the truth is as, as being justified in the Spirit. That's why with some people that just hate the truth, they attack the King James Bible, they have no love of the truth, I can say they're lost. Why? Because justification of the Spirit is you have a love of the truth. The real Jesus and His perfect written word. The real Jesus Christ. Uh, change life. You say, well, what's... The, uh, justification of the Spirit. The Spirit comes in and brings us into all truth. I had to get rid of those mo Hollywood movies, TV shows, and video games. Satanic style music. The porn that I was watching. I had to stop doing all that stuff. I had to start eating right. I started living right. I, before I was saved, I wasn't reading the Bible. Now that I'm saved, I read this every morning and every night before bed. I start my day with it. I end my day with it. I study it. I pray all the time. I didn't pray before I was saved. I pray all the time. God has cleaned up my life. I'm not the same man that I was. I get this from a lot of my family members. I just don't know what happened to you. You're just not the same man you were. The changed life, sanctification, and abounding in the work of the Lord. It's not just the changed life, but you love the Lord so much, you're going to preach His Word. Men get called into ministry to preach His Word. Brothers and sisters in Christ are out there preaching the plan of salvation that's found in His Word. Being ambassadors, the ministry of reconciliation. You have people out there that just hate preaching the, the gospel, they don't want to preach the gospel, that's a red flag. You might lack courage sometimes, and you need courage, but the Holy Spirit that's in you will do what? He'll give you courage, He'll give you strength. The Bible says, I can do all things through Christ. He is the way, the truth, and the life. The Holy Spirit comes in to guide us into all truth. The Holy Spirit comes in to give us strength through Jesus Christ. Okay. And the other third one I put on here was the love of the brethren. There might be a little bit here and there, but these are the three main ones. The love of the brethren. Are you praying for the bro your brothers and sisters in Christ every day? When you see a brother and sister in Christ struggling financially or spiritually, do you have your hand out? Do you have your hand out? Or do you keep to yourself? Something to think about. Okay. The way some brethren, I've, t I've said, I told some brethren I believe they're wrong, and how they've responded, sometimes they respond with, with love back, saying, like, well, we can talk about it, or I just disagree with you for right now until God shows me differently. But I've had some brethren just, the way they respond, it's just bitterness and hate and anger. 
That's not how you're supposed to respond. Justification of spirit. Love of the truth. Changed life. Love of the brethren. Jesus Christ was justified in the spirit. If you're truly saved and born again, Bible-believing, God-fearing man and woman, there should be some justification of the spirit. That's why Paul said, prove your own selves. Know your own selves. He talks about being reprobate. There's fake Christians out there. There's wolves in sheep's clothing he talks about. He cried night and day with tears for three years because he saw wolves in sheep's clothing coming in pretending to be one of us and destroying all the work that he had done. Messing up the church at Corinth. Messing up the church at uh, Galatia. Galatians. At Galatia. Messing up the body of Christ. Night and day with tears. He talks about false brethren. Okay. Brothers and sisters of Christ, anybody that comes to you and says, you can't judge whether someone's saved or not, stay away from them. Just utterly stay away from them. They're there to deceive you. Okay? The Bible says we're to judge, but we're to judge righteous judgment. We're to judge according to this book. There should be justification in you as a, the Holy Spirit, justification of the Spirit in you as a Christian. And a lot of my brothers and sisters in Christ, there has been. If you're newly saved, and I'll end it with this, if you're newly saved and you're still struggling with the flesh a lot, you've got to stop fighting the Lord. got to stop fighting the Lord, spend more time in the book, spend more time singing hymns, spend more time with Bible studies. I've um, uh, been start recently contacting a lot of newly saved brethren through Skype. Um, you know, there's other platforms out there where you can vi visually talk with the brethren and get encouragement from the brethren and talk about the Bible, talk about what's going on in the world. But don't be discouraged to the point where you just turn your back on God completely. That's what false converts do. Don't give up on the Lord. I always used to pray, Lord, please don't give up. When I was newly saved, you think that people think that I was born when I was born again, I'm like I am today. No, I wasn't. You don't know how much I prayed when I was newly saved. I kept praying, Lord, don't give up on me. I had failed the Lord, was struggling with the flesh left and right when I was newly saved. And I would pray that prayer, Lord, don't give up on me. It wasn't until later that the real prayer was that I should have been praying was not that the Lord doesn't give up on me because he won't. If you're truly saved and born again, God's not going to give up on you. But the real prayer is, is, Lord, don't let me give up on you. I didn't know that back then. Okay? Don't give up on the Lord. Stand, stand, stand. If you fall down, you let the Lord pick you right back up. Get that sin out of your life and get back to living for the Lord. Get back to your first love, the Word of God. That sin, that whatever caused you to fall flat on your face, it was pulling you away from the Word of the Lord, get back to the Word of the Lord. Get back to loving Jesus Christ, loving the truth. Get back to sanctification and doing the work of the Lord, abounding in the work of the Lord. Anytime you fall, you say, flesh is not going to win. You jump up, you get that sin out of your life, and you get back to living for the Lord. It's not about God giving up on you. It's about, are you going to give up on the Lord Jesus Christ? After everything He's done for you, are you going to give up on Him? I pray you don't. So hopefully this was a good study for some of the brethren to understand the justification of the Spirit. Okay, it's manifest as prophecy. Manifest as wisdom. Truth, absolute truth, that manifests itself in miracles, signs and wonders, and it manifests itself in prophecy. When prophecy comes true, you know that the whole, it was of the Holy Spirit. When someone tries to make prophecies today and they don't come true, that's not the Holy Spirit. So grace and peace from God our Father and our Lord Jesus Christ be with you all, and my love for you, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Thank you for watching. Stay the path, brothers and sisters Christ, stay the path. We're almost there. We're almost there. <laughs>